The Edge at 11 starts now. Tonight on The Edge, more fallout from the sexual assault investigation involving a basketball coach at Farmington High School. The school has now fired several other coaches from the basketball program for knowing about the alleged behavior and not reporting it. Fox News' Jessica Dupnack joining us live. And Jessica, that is so troubling because someone could have said something sooner and prevented possibly something from happening. We had a lot of questions, Taryn, for Farmington Public Schools. We would have asked them, had we been granted an interview with anybody from the schools? We asked twice, got denied twice, and actually they referred us to a statement. So we went to the school board, talked to the president by phone. She referred us to the superintendent. That was obviously a dead end. It's pretty amazing that no one will answer some of these tough questions, given the allegations here and the cover up. I was horrified, obviously, and concerned. It's the reaction of parents we talked to all day Tuesday, nervous to show their faces, worried about fallout from Farmington Public Schools in the wake of this scandal. I hate to say it, but I wasn't necessarily surprised just because there has been a culture of covering things up in this district for quite a long time. First, bombshell allegations against the Farmington High School boys basketball junior varsity coach last week. Detroit Police Special Victims Unit is investigating him for sexual assaults multiple against his own players. Sources tell us he'd invite players for overnight study sessions at his Detroit home. Then they take a terrible sexual turn. Kids just 14 and 15 years old. A day after Fox two broke that story. More shock in the district. Three other coaches fired for allegedly having some knowledge of these purported sexual encounters and choosing not to report them. These are the people that are supposed to keep our kids safe. And if they're not willing to report something as egregious as what has been going on, um, then they have no business um, being in, in coaching or in the education field at all. Of those fired, varsity head coach Derek McDowell, an illustrious coaching career in our area, and as an assistant basketball coach at Eastern and Central Michigan Universities. Farmington Public Schools said this in part. To be clear, the other coaches are not accused of improper conduct with players. Rather, they did not meet the required threshold as mandatory reporters to ensure the safety and well-being of student athletes. The JV coach at the center of it all has been a coach for more than a decade, which could lead to offshoot investigations outside the one underway by Detroit police. When we have a situation like this, we really need to think about how it happened and how we can prevent it from happening in another, another school, another, with another sport, with other coaches. The JV coach at the center of all of this, we are not naming him at this point because he has not been formally charged at this point. Now, he was fired last week. The school says as soon as they learned of those allegations, he's also been forbidden to enter any of the properties owned by Farmington Public Schools. Reporting in Farmington, Jessica Dupnack on the edge. Jessica, in regards to these other coaches, how was the district alerted to them knowing at least something about what allegedly happening uh, happened to these students and where does the investigation stand right now with DPD? So as soon as the criminal investigation was launched simultaneously, the schools launched their own internal investigation. That was last week. And after our report yesterday, I would imagine that spurred some movement with that mm -hmm. internal investigation. And then we learned today that those three other coaches were fired. We did talk to a spokesperson with DPD. They said their detectives are actively working the case, getting it ready to submit to the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office for potential charges. Well, sounds like they are on it. Thanks, Jessica, for that really, though, troubling update. Also tonight, Detroit is hit by another strike, this one against the city's three casinos. And now, Taryn, thousands of workers are on the picket line downtown. Take a look. Casino workers walking off the job at noon today after they couldn't reach a deal with Motor City, MGM, or Hollywood Casino at Greektown. Employees want to maintain their current health care plans, earn higher salaries, and receive better contributions to their retirement accounts. First, we have Blue Cross on strike right across the street, and my dad's on strike at GM, and my cousin's on strike at Chrysler. It says a message that we are all willing to stick together and we are willing to fight for what we deserve. 
In a statement, Hollywood Casino at Greetown saying it remains open, but a la carte restaurants and valet services will be impacted. We've already had a lot of uh, damage done, but we're in the danger zone in terms of being able to sustain all the investments that we have and all the businesses we have now. The UAW has been on strike for more than a month, and it is costly. According to the Anderson Economic Group, the big three automakers have lost a combined $3.45 billion. Production on popular vehicles like the Ford F-150 and Silverado may withstand the impact of the strike, but the smaller crossover vehicles may not. And that latest economic report on the UAW strike paints a grim picture for parts suppliers. And it could be the end of the line for some of those businesses. Fox 2's Dave Kinchin reports on what this could mean for our local economy. In centerline, workers for the Stellantis parts supplier Mopar hold firm in the increasingly bitter October cold on strike day 33. Hopefully we get things moving faster. We out here, rain, sleet, or snow. But as the picketing continues, auto suppliers are taking deeper hits. We out here for y'all. We out here for y'all. We get paid more, you get paid more. Everybody eats. Supplier wages and earnings are down nearly $2.7 billion, according to the Anderson Economic Group. There have been surveys done that have indicated that about a third of the suppliers in general are in some financial difficulty. Wayne State business professor Merrick Masters says the small suppliers make the plastic and metal parts that go into the cars we love and right now they risk running out of money. So they cover the gamut. They're not necessarily mom and pop but they're small businesses. They may have 10 to 20 employees, 30 employees or less and they don't generate a whole lot of revenue on an annual basis but they generate enough to sustain that number of workers and provide good living wages for people. As tier one is, they're forced to scale back operations, the tier two that are maybe more dependent on these companies will have to scale back even more. Meantime, the striking workers we talked with say they feel the pain of the suppliers, but have to keep fighting their fight. I hope it gets better for them if we get back to work and we get a tentative agreement soon. That'll be good for everybody. Meantime, a sign Stellantis is feeling the pinch of the strike. They pulled out of the CES Tech Expo, citing a need to save money and blaming it on the walkout. Stellantis also looking to sell that headquarters in Auburn Hills, that big tower as you drive up I-75. Now, that's part of a longer strategy, longer range strategy to save money, but you have to figure with the strike costing the automakers so much money, that's definitely factoring in somewhere towards that bottom line as well. Dave Kinchin on the edge. More water problems in Romulus. The city has issued another boil water advisory. This affects residents in the area south of Eureka between Huron River Drive and Inkster. The same area dealt with a boil advisory last week. It had been lifted last Tuesday. Crews are working to resolve the issue. It's not clear tonight how long residents will need to boil their water. Well, we are stuck in a cold front, but there are rumors things may turn around. Hey, that's good news. I mean, look, we're not we're not in the depth of winter or the deep fall yet. Captain Rich Luderman has a little hope in our forecast. Rich. What we need is sunshine. That's what we're waiting yes. for. Tomorrow's our day. Here's our next storm system coming out of the Canadian Rockies. That'll be spinning down in our area for Thursday and Friday. But for tomorrow, some splashes of sun. You can see there are breaks in the clouds out there. Boy, we need some sun. How about live pictures from Chicago O'Hare Airport? Quiet there. Uh, traffic moving freely. Take a look at the numbers for us 52 and 46 still below average it's been that way for a while now ready for a warm-up that's tomorrow as well 40 in Ann Arbor 48 in Pontiac 45 up there in Lapeer cool air up north 37s for Marquette and for North Bay there's Chicago at 53 for us high pressure is going to hit the east sea uh, eastern seaboard and that'll allow our next storm system to move through the central Great Lakes so occasional showers Thursday and Friday and Saturday as well. Here's our forecast for the rest of tonight. Chilly down to 42. Tomorrow's not a bad looking day. It's going to be the best day probably of the next five or six up to 62 with partly sunny skies right there is the seven day showers and cooler weather for Friday and Saturday, including the game inside Spartan Stadium. How about a full check starting at 4 a.m. Someone's shooting. Someone's shooting inside. 
An update tonight to this terrifying scene in Dearborn where a gunman opened fire during a wedding. A 60 year old man has been charged in the incident that sent guests scrambling to safety last week at the Dearborn Manor Banquet Hall. Hyder Al Jabori of Dearborn Heights faces several charges, including assault with intent to murder. Even though no one was hurt, the judge gave the suspected shooter a half million dollar cash bond because of the serious nature of the alleged crime. From the gubernatorial race to prison. Today, Republican Ryan Kelly was sentenced to two months in federal prison for his role in the January 6th Capitol riots. Prosecutors said that Kelly helped rioters breach scaffolding and gestured for others to move closer to the Capitol building. Over the summer, he pled guilty to a misdemeanor for his role. Once he's released, Kelly will serve one year of probation.